the Honorable Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. But before we get started, I um, let's please really have a moment of silence in memory of George Floyd and the 100,000 plus coronavirus victim. Thank you. And now, without further ado, I know that the mayor really has really a very tight schedule. I'm going to pass the microphone to um, our daughters, really, Merhawit and Messaret Mahzul, to Eritrean American college students at the University of uh, San Francisco, and also really that they are um, uh, members really of the City of Los Angeles Youth Ambassador cohort from year 2015 to present. So, Ms. Arret, can you please lead us? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Mengis. So, hello and welcome everyone to today's conference. I'm so glad you could make it. Um, joining us via Zoom video is the Mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. As Mayor of a city representing over 140 countries and speaking over 220 languages, he is no stranger to the international community. He studied the Eritrean Revolution at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and has spent significant time in 80 to 83 countries. Many of the Eritrean and Ethiopian diasporas have long settled and called Los Angeles home, including Meb Keplizki, the late Nipsey Hussle, and many others. My sister and I have been blessed with the opportunity, as mentioned before, to be youth ambassadors for the city of Los Angeles since 2015, and have always been impressed with the amount of respect the mayor has shown for the people that he serves. We are very fortunate to have him here with us today in this great time of distress. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Eric Garcetti. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, and it's great to be with everybody and to be with you, Dr. Bayru. Thank you for your leadership. Meb, it's wonderful to see you. At Sega, thank you for your leadership. And to our two ambassadors who have been not the leaders of tomorrow, but the leaders of today. Thank you for continuing to lead. These are such difficult days, aren't they? These are such painful days, aren't they? Um, we see people on the streets of America's cities because of what happened to George Floyd. And my heart breaks for another dark chapter in one of the most terrible books on our shelves of American history. But I also, in the midst of this COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, see such courage and such incredible love and such generosity in trying times. To be Eritrean is, by definition, to be resilient. Maybe in America, a new generation, and certainly even my generation, didn't face the sorts of things that we know of sacrifice and pain and suffering that all Eritreans in the longest war in Africa's history, in the ongoing struggles to continue to build a nation and to recognize and realize democracy and people's rights, the ongoing work that we have to do when we leave a country and become immigrants, which is the story of America, and of course, the Eritrean diaspora. And we begin to see in business and in politics, and we see in culture and art, the impact that Eritrean Americans have made, and it's incredible, it's beautiful, it's a strong golden thread in the fabric that we are making each and every day in America. But it's painful when that fabric starts to tear as we were seeing on the streets the last couple nights. So first, I just wanna say something to all the young people. As young people of African descent, we see in this country that this country was built on the backs of slavery and of the legacy of so much racism that we have to undo in our hearts and our minds. And that isn't just the work for black Americans, this is the work for all Americans. And it isn't just about justice and a criminal justice system Long before we saw the images of George Floyd, the horrible, sick, vile images of his death, we saw Rodney King get beat here. We saw unrest in Los Angeles before some of you were born. And it has made Los Angeles a more resilient city as well to do the right things, to ensure that there's justice for everybody. In this COVID-19 crisis, I have the same worries that when we see moments of friction they don't create division, they highlight inequality. They highlight how if you're an immigrant, you're more likely to 
not be economically as prosperous. If you're black in America, you're more likely to be arrested, homeless, underemployed, um, your health indicators are worse. And so the work that we do is not just to address a pandemic and to declare victory and say, yay, but is to make sure we're reaching out to every community because people also say words like black America when we realize how diverse, you know, I'm one of the lucky people because not only do I know Eritrea and love Eritrea and have lived in Eritrea, but I understand the difference between not just Eritrea and Ethiopia, but within Eritrea, uh, what it means to be Tigrayan versus Tigrinian, uh, what it means to come you know, from the North or to be Kumara or some of the other ethnic groups that comprise the nine major groups of Eritrea and its diversity. And similarly in America, to be of Caribbean descent or to be of African descent or to be of native black American descent, we can't speak with one voice of all people. We have to make sure we reach out and touch all communities, which is why I'm so excited to be on this call. I need you to be warriors. I need you to be warriors inside your community when it comes to COVID-19. There are many people who think, hey, I'm young, this can't happen to me. And yet I talked to a police officer a month ago who lost his wife who was perfectly healthy in her 30s. He was asymptomatic, brought home, I guess, COVID-19 and she got it and died and their young children now have no mother. This can affect everyone. We see also particularly that African-Americans are more likely to be working through the COVID-19 epidemic, whether it's in government or uh, critical jobs in hospitals and other places. So they're more vulnerable. And in many cities, we're dying at twice the rate of the population. So we've surged testing and testing for all of you who are in Los Angeles is free and you don't have to have symptoms. So please get tested, especially if you're working or you're looking at going into the public a lot. That's something that's there for you and we need to do that work. And in the Eritrean community too, we have to make sure those who might not know English very well or get their news from each evening briefing that I do, that they know what to do to wear face masks, to wash their hands, to physically distance, to do all of the things that will stop the spread. On the other hand, we have to get the economy going. I know many of you are, are businessmen and women and another week or another month and you feel you'll never come back. And so that's why we are learning a lot and safely reopening things. But it depends on all of us being sure we abide by the rules, that we listen to the advice, that we insist on face coverings and uh, physical distancing to make sure we can get through. So I'm confident in you. I'm confident that, like I said, to be Eritrean is to be strong and tough and resilient and beautiful. And in this moment, we need all of those qualities. The beauty of helping each other, the strength that we need to be able to get through tough days like now, and the resilience to know this won't be done just in a week or a month, but it will take some time. Uh, but I want to thank again, uh, Sega Hapte for her incredible leadership in organizing this um, amazing uh, grouping. And let me uh, now listen to some questions instead of talking at you to see what I can do to best serve this amazing American community. Thank you so much for that update. Um, so now I'll ask the first question. So in the Eritrean community, we have many small business owners who are struggling and trying to figure out how to safely open their businesses and serve the community. Are there any resources to help them do this safely? There are. So if you go, if you're in the city of Los Angeles and you go to coronavirus.lacity.org, you can call 3112 if you're not able to get on the internet, but I think most of us can now, coronavirus.lacity.org slash business. And we have information about the small business loans that we've had and grants. I hope to announce in the next two or three weeks some more money for that because we've gotten some money from Washington and we wanna uh, use that. And we're coming together with the County of Los Angeles to help. So that's one place. Uh, on there, you also have guides for reopening. If you're a restaurant, for instance, how much space, how many people, how do I, get things going. What sort of personal protective equipment do I need? And so you have a checklist there that tells you everything you have to do to open. Restaurants now can open under the state and county guidelines. That doesn't mean you have to open. Some people said, why did you say it like with one minute notice? And I said, I just said it because the county, which is in charge, said it's permissible. But don't worry, if you wanted a week to wait, take a week to wait and make sure that you know that you can be safe, your customers can be safe. And also, for those of you who are involved with restaurants, we're gonna be opening up the sidewalks for people and parking lots if you have them to be able to put tables out there 
So even if you can, if you have less capacity, only 60%, you can at least space it out and maybe have as many customers because I know it's very difficult to survive on 25 or 40% capacity. Um, and then lastly, I would say for businesses as well, we have um, assistance to try to get you to some of the federal programs that exist as well. So if you call 311, our business assistance centers can help you with that. And like I said, I hope in the next two weeks we'll be able to announce something good. For those of you, one last thing, who are business owners who own, for instance, apartments, we just announced a $100 million fund to help pay landlords and to help renters who can't pay their rent so you don't lose your buildings. This will probably start July 1st, so there's nothing to do to apply for it now. But by the beginning of our fiscal year is July 1st. We're going to put $100 million. So if you're a renter that needs assistance or a business person who owns an apartment or apartments, that's a place that you can apply. Thank you so much for that in-depth answer. And also, I just want to remind everyone that um, the links that are mentioned and the resources that were mentioned are going to be posted on the recording on the Birex website. So if you didn't get all of that information written down, it's going to be available later. Um, and now for the second question, uh, as you mentioned before, and I'm sure you're aware, the black communities across the country are dealing with two crises right now, uh, coronavirus and racism. There's so many people that are angry and in agony about the death of George Floyd in Minnesota, as well as systemic racism overall. So what are your thoughts on this and what is your office doing to respond to this? So. My thoughts are the following, as I said a little bit in the opening, that this is not something new. This is something that is unfortunately part of the foundation of this country. So the first thing you have to do is admit that and speak the truth of it, that not everybody starts at the same place on the starting line, that centuries of oppression and racism make it so that people aren't running the same race. I'll use a metaphor for Meb. It's like if you put Meb, two miles behind to start the race, he couldn't win it. Uh, but this is what we've done with racism in America. And a, a second thought is this is not something that is just the work of black Americans. Latino and white and Asian and Native Americans all need to see the work of what it means to be black in America. Not just for black men, but especially for black men because black women also face uh, the legacy of racism, more likely to die in childbirth, more likely to have bad health indicators. But with the criminal justice system in particular, black men unduly are just seen as a threat in a way that they're white and sometimes Latinos have experienced this very deeply too, but certainly white and Asian counterparts don't. So what do we do? Two things. One is we reform the criminal justice system here in Los Angeles. Um, we, like I said, are not better. We just went through this earlier with Rodney King. You need civilian police commissions. You need independent investigations. You need, juries to you need juries to convict and prosecutors to prosecute police officers who break the law. You need to have body cameras like we've done. You need to have implicit bias training. That's a fancy way of saying, I've had every police officer go through a training to learn about the racism that they have. All of us carry bias, you know? I could ask you about some, somebody or some color or some country, and we all have bias. We have to admit that. And then once we recognize it, we can work beyond that. We have to train police officers to de-escalate situations, de-escalate peacefully. I had a police officer I know very well who was dealing with somebody who was on a train here in Los Angeles who had mental health problems. And he could have been old fashioned and called on his radio, takes his radio out and called for five more police officers and wrestled this person to the ground. Instead, he pulled a sandwich out and he said, are you hungry? And it calmed the man down. There are so many things we can learn that don't require guns, that don't require force. And so we have to continue that work of insisting on justice. Second, we have to not just look at policing as the answer. We have to invest in people. Here in Los Angeles, for every dollar that we add to the police budget, we have to add a dollar to prevention and youth programs. I'm very proud of having written that law. And now we have 50% more um, uh, former gang members and, um, you know, youth development experts who work with young people who are at risk of being the victims of and the perpetrators of crime. We made the minimum wage go up. We made community college free. We said when the COVID-19 crisis broke out and African Americans, just 9% of our population were 15% of the deaths. We said we have to do something about that and change that. So now we've brought those down to just 12%. We have to keep going until it's 
equal or below the population because it's not acceptable to see black Americans die disproportionately. And our work didn't begin today. It didn't begin with George Floyd and it doesn't end tomorrow even if we get those things. It is ongoing and the last piece is very personal. We have to have these discussions. We have to, in our places where we study and where we work and where we live, we have to say things that make us uncomfortable and we have to listen. Especially those of us that are not black in America, we can't say we're against racism. The woman in Central Park who was worried about a black man who was a bird watcher, she told everybody, I'm not racist. So everybody says they're not racist. The question is, are you an anti-racist? Are you working as an anti-racist with active programs, active involvement, supporting people to make sure we change what is wrong in this country? So that is, I know, a long answer, but it's a, it deserves a long answer because we have to do it in our hearts, in our criminal justice system, and in our society as well. Yeah, snaps to that. <laughs> um, uh, Honorable Mayor Eric Garcetti, on behalf of the Eritrean community, I'd like to offer a big thank you and expression of deep gratitude for your tireless leadership and for your willingness to take time out of your very busy day to speak to us. We are committed partner and we look forward to seeing and hearing from you again soon. We would also like to thank um, Southwest Area Representative David Price for working with us to make this event possible. And yes, hello, David. Thank you so much. <laughs> we know how you have a busy day ahead, so we will let you go. But please stay safe and thank you again. Thank you thank so you much. Mercy. Thank you, Merha. And thank you all so much. Great to see you all. Thank much, you. much love. Thank you. See you soon. I'd also okay. like to thank Mayor Garcetti for your leadership, for your time, for your support, and for understanding each culture, each language, that we are all unique and different. But as you said, the most asset that we have is the human being, human being to be able to learn from each other. And we didn't have to learn from our mistakes, but we could also learn from other people's mistakes to be a better Americans. You know, we bring different cultures, different ethnicity from different around the world. Well, but the good things we can bring with us, like the Eritrean community, I'm pretty sure you're aware of how collective, how mm -hmm. caring, how resilient they are. And the American independence that give us to be the best that we can with technology and the people who helped us be the best empowering that knowledge that we see that is there to bring us the best so i really really appreciate you taking the time to come and share this very very deeply and on behalf of the Amer uh, Eritrean american thank you and i wish you all the best i know you got busy and a lot of things go moving around so we should our prayers and thoughts are with you thank you champ appreciate it very much man. thank you take care. all right take care guys take care. see you soon bye. peace bye. and love bye, bye. all right Marhawit or Masarret, you have any questions yeah. for Mab? Yeah, sure. So we want to say thank you, Meb, for joining us today. Um, we do have one question. So as we're going through so much during COVID-19, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and financially, um, we want to know what advice do you have for us as young people of color during this time, especially during the time of unrest after the murder of George Floyd and uh, many others? Thank you, Marhawit and Masarret. It is uh, as Mayor Garcetti says, it's a tough time every, in every way I can think of. And, but you guys are the future of, the, you know, the leaders of the future going forward. And to be able to just work the best that you can, keep what you can control. What can you control? You know, now you are, and you have time. Maybe before you didn't have time. How do you learn? How do you educate yourself? Take care of yourself mentally, physically, and emotionally. And financially, everybody's at despair. You know, you want to work, you want to be able to come back. You have to understand that health comes first. When health comes first, you can take care of yourself, you can take care of your family, you can take care of your community. So in that regard, you know, you know, the protesting is, uh, is necessary, but also with the coronavirus happening, you know, when people are getting together and it's going to even, you know, take another notch of uh, relapse per, ha per se. In, in that regard, you got to be able to be careful. I'm not saying don't protest, but at the same time, you have to be able to be aware and educate, you know, I think it's important to learn about our culture, about other people's differences, and, uh, you know, and be the best that we can. You know, there's a, a rich community brings a lot of collectiveness, and a lot of the U.S., unfortunately, sometimes a lot of individualism. And how do we make that two together? Because sometimes we need independence, but at the same time, have the culture that we are 
embrace that we've been taught, educate them. And then I think as, you know, Asian community personally have, you know, you know, we culture, we eat together, we are fresh food and all that stuff. Don't take it for granted. It is something that if you are healthy, nutritionally, you're going to be healthy thinking and healthy moving forward. And activities are important. I think physical activity at home or, or go for a walk. You don't have to be a runner like me, run 26 miles. I think a mile or two is plenty enough, but have routine. You know? And you know, when you go for a walk, just put your six feet or 10 feet away, but greet others with dignity and respect because they're going to get to know you. Once they get to know you, they're going to start ad uh, adapt who you are, what your beliefs are. And hopefully in, in the next future, in the next two, three months or forward, it would bring, bring us the best of us and collectively. And uh, I think it's important to, you know, be the best that you can. I mean, at the end of the day is take care of yourself, be the ver better version of yourself and know that there's other people who are in need. And, and if you know there's, especially in the region community, if there are elders that they can't wear the mask, go, go and do a grocery store for them too, because anybody is at risk, but you know, the young that we are, not that we are at risk, but we can do more things. We can wash, we, can, we are more cognitive of what we need to do, wash our hands and don't touch our nose, our ears and, uh, and mouth. Right, thank you so much for that positive response. No problem. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Mangus. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so I really appreciate really all of you to be on this call. It was really a great pleasure to have a mayor of Los Angeles. So and uh, I think his message was really very powerful and uh, resonated very well with all our thinking. And uh, Matt, thank you really for um, for highlighting really the key, the, key, the key points. And Marhawit and Masaret, you are, as the mayor said, not the future uh, leaders, but the current leaders. And so keep it up. Please really continue encouraging others. And we hope really to have more and more of the youth really taking the leads so that really you guys can lead us to the next really phase of our lives. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.